Uh, hey everyone, I'm AJ from the Arbitrum team. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, thank you, thank you. I want to first give a shout out to the ETCC. You know, all the organizers and sponsors have been a kick ass week and have had a great time, so shout out to them. So the age of roll-ups, the one thing I won't be doing is announcing Arbitrum ZK EVM. I'm going to leave that to the experts in that field. It's been a week for that. But um, I really want to talk here about you know, the efforts that have gone in over the last two years, basically, since we launched on Testnet. What's gone into building the ecosystem, the challenges, you know, what we're working to go to move everything the ecosystem forward. Um, but for that, you have to start at the beginning. So Vitalik in October 2020 spoke about Ethereum's roll-up-centric roadmap. And Ethereum today, you know, that was right after DeFi summer, really gas prices for the first time since maybe CryptoKitties in 20, 2017, 2018, was really starting to spike. And, you know, over time, you know, towards the end of the ETH2, you, you, you have data availability and um, execution on base chain. But until then, you know, data availability is, is very helpful for rollups as execution environments. And as Vitalik said, the Ethereum ecosystem is likely to be all in on rollups, plus some plasma and channels as a scaling strategy for the near and midterm future. So you have rollups as the execution environments, everything settling on top of Ethereum. And that's what we're building at Arbitrum, an optimistic rollup solution. So what are the differences between rollups and sidechains? So one of the main differences is data availability. Who's holding the data? In a rollup, the, the data is posted to Ethereum. It's not posted in another environment. Another difference is on bridging. So when you're bridging out of Ethereum layer one, what are you bridging into? Are you bridging it into a multi-sig that's controlled you know, in, in, in an alternative L1 environment or a sidechain? That's not the case for a roll-up. With a roll-up, what you're bridging it is into a contract can, that, that can be enforced on the layer one. From a security perspective, roll-ups utilize fraud proofs, or optimistic roll-ups utilize fraud proofs, and ZK roll-ups utilize validity proofs, which ensure that the behavior that took place off-chain in the Arbitrum environment or a different roll-up environment can actually be guaranteed by Ethereum layer one and the call data that's been posted there. And attacks. In a roll-up environment, you only need to trust one validator, and that validator can be yourself. So roll-up environments can withstand attacks of up to 99% of validators. So this is the Arbitrum timeline before we get into it. We launched Arbitrum on testnet in October 2020, had a number of iterations. I think we went through six testnets before we hit a release candidate. And in March 2020, we were ready. Then when we hit mainnet, we've said, this is a new ecosystem. The entire ecosystem is extremely excited for rollups and scaling technologies. How do we roll this out? You know, if you onboard one project at a time, they don't have dependencies they need. It's very difficult for them to attract liquidity. You don't have infrastructure there. So how do you, how do you roll this out? And what you do is we took a 90-day period where we just opened for developers. And it was any developers that wanted to integrate. And we had hundreds of teams building. You, you know, the major DEXs like Uniswap, Sushi, Curve, Balancer, um, Etherscan, the graph. And we'll get into all these different components. But the, the key was, was that we allowed an environment similar to Ethereum layer one to be reciprocated before you had users and liquidity um, sort of dampening what the user experience might look like um, at launch. We, went, we opened for Oct um, August 2021 20, to, to users. And then we have our V2, the Nitro technology, which we'll get into a little bit, which is going to be going live um, very soon. It's been on, um, on testnet since about April 2022. So what does the Arbitrum ecosystem look like? Today, there's been $2.3 billion bridged into Arbitrum from Ethereum, in addition to all Arbitrum native assets. Arbitrum currently has 53% of the roll-up market share. There's been over 35,000 contracts deployed, and there's more than 1 million unique addresses. And what are they doing on Arbitrum? And the answer, in short, is a little bit of everything. And that's what makes Arbitrum so special. You have the, the, the native blue, DeFi blue chips of L1, the Uniswap, Sushi, Aave, Curve, Yearn, and Balance are all deployed and working together the same way they did on L1. And then you have Arbitrum native DeFi projects. You know, some, some might be familiar with GMX, Dopex, Vesta. Um, They've done a great job of building a theory, Arbitrum native communities um, and really growing their user bases in, in a low-cost environment. Treasure DAO, for instance, has been building what they call the Nintendo, the decentralized Nintendo. They've been you know, working with dozens of games and NFT projects around their ecosystem. Um, and a lot of this is powered by the fact that you have 
the infrastructure that everyone's comfortable with, whether that's RPC providers like Infura, Alchemy, and QuickNode, the familiarity of a block explorer like Etherscan, the graph for indexing and covalent, or Chainlink for or price feeds, or if you're a DAO that needs a multi-sig, you can use Gnosis Safe. So all of that is available on Arbitrum, and that's what's allowed the, the ecosystem to, to grow so quickly. While we've had all of that success and the community has really been growing, there are progress, there are challenges that need to be discussed as a community, not just that can be tackled by us in a top-down environment, but how we can think about together bringing more people into the Arbitrum ecosystem, and more importantly, having more people aligned with the Ethereum roll-up centric roadmap. There's a typical chicken and an egg problem here. Liquidity remains on layer one, users are on layer one, gas fees don't come down because they don't migrate to layer two, and applications don't want to launch on layer two because the liquidity and the users remain on layer one. So how do we work on that together? There's some things that we can do at Arbitrum, that's what we've been working on, but there's also, you know, in, co you know, in coordination with users, liquidity providers, and application developers, we all have to come together. So I just want to talk through a couple of those things and, and see how we can tackle them. So the first thing is onboarding. Uh, when we launched Arbitrum, this is the bridge that it took to get into the Arbitrum ecosystem. We took some inspiration from Curve. Um, the, the flow was essentially you went from Ethereum layer 1 to Ethereum layer 2. So if you lived in a centralized exchange and you wanted to interact with DeFi for the first time because gas fees were affordable, you had to withdraw to layer 1 and then go into layer 2. It was a terrible user experience. We spent a lot of time working with partners to how do we get to this, which is where we are at today. Now you can enter the Arbitrum ecosystem using FTX, Binance, Bybit, all these major centralized exchanges, or you can also onboard into the Arbitrum ecosystem from different environments, whether it's through cross-chain bridges like Hop, Connect, Seller, and the other ones listed up here, or directly buying ETH or other you know, um, supported tokens through fiat on-ramps directly, B banks, uh, ramp, transact, and simplex. So this is the Arbitrum this is how we've been seeing over time. We went from 100% of users coming directly from L1 to that number continuing to go down. People are coming from centralized exchanges, they're coming from alternative layer ones, other roll-ups as well, and that's how they're able to interact, with this, to interact with the Arbitrum ecosystem. They don't need to touch layer one. We can really have Ethereum in the roll-up-centric roadmap vision focus on data availability and not have users be competing with roll-ups for block space. You know, one thing that's always interesting, and I think what I think is super cool is that there are days where Arbitrum is, is responsible for more than 2 or 3% of the gas that's used on, layer two, on, on, on Ethereum layer 1. And the reason that is we're representing you know, hundreds of transactions in a batch. And if you're, if you're living on layer 1, that's what you're competing with. You're competing with a batch that's posted by Arbitrum to Ethereum layer 1, representing hundreds of users. And if you want to go to an environment where your gas fees come down and we can... We can accelerate that effort by having people move into layer two environments more quickly, um, this is the way to do it. So this is the future of what the Arbitrum bridge looks like. So we went from going directly from layer one, and this is not live, this is gonna be going live hopefully next week, where basically we're redesigning our UI to interact with all of these different pieces that are built into the system. So if you wanna cross into Arbitrum, you can cross from layer ones, you can cross into the Arbitrum from other rollups, and you don't have to use the L1 bridge, which is the most expensive. We, we're working with integrating Hop, Seller Connect, and all these different bridges that are gonna be going live to have their assets supported directly into Arbitrum, making fees cheaper and a much more frictionless experience for users. So that's just a little bit of a introduction to what's coming. So what are the other challenges? And this is a community call to action. It's really about liquidity. So if you look at, this is sort of a list of the top tokens that live on Arbitrum, and you can see there's really sufficient liquidity for ETH. The Arbitrum bridge currently holds about 670,000 ETH, which is the 10th most of any wallet or smart contract address. And ETH, USDC, and Tether, we see really strong liquidity within the ecosystem. Dopex, which is an Arbitrum native project, has sufficient liquidity for their token. But what you see once you sort of get into other native governance tokens or utility tokens, there really is insufficient liquidity that's, that's being bridged into the ecosystem. And that's not something we can do ourselves. We need to work with these communities to be bridging their tokens into ecosystems that can, that can expand what this ecosystem looks like. Um, and that's really a community call to effort. You know, how do we get the curves, the Uniswap communities of the world to start thinking about their, 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 their strategy around you know, um, liquidity provisioning you know, outside of layer one to expand those communities. The next one is I want to talk about is DAO migration. 
and, and this is really important. Right now, what a lot of DAOs are doing is they're living on layer one. And they're either using snapshot or choosing to do voting on Gnosis chain as a side chain, but they don't want to migrate off of layer one. And that's really, I think, for, to me, it's a little bit disappointing in the sense that if we really want to be inclusive and get more people to do on-chain activity, and DAOs are a vehicle for that, we really need to be doing it in environments where we don't have to compromise on things like on-chain activity. Or if you want to have more aggressive treasury management strategies that in requires DAOs to think about you know, more on-chain interactions, how do we have those DAOs living? And we think you know, Arbitrum and Layer 2 technologies, the migration of those DAOs from Layer 1, or social DAOs, or community DAOs, or whatever people are you know, looking to, 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 to coalesce around, really should be living in Layer 2 environments. Um, and the reason for that is you're really aligning with the roll-up centric roadmap of Ethereum. The, the vision is not that it takes $25 in gas fees for somebody to join a DAO by buying a token or wanting to vote. The goal is to, how do we get this as cheap as possible without compromising on security? Um, if there's any DAOs out there that want to talk, I'm, I would love to talk about you know, how we can have sort of DAOs that aren't native to Arbitrum originally, but have been native to Ethereum, about how they can think about their migration strategy um, and, and join the ecosystem. I think that this is important because this is what it has, leads to community inclusivity. If you want to broaden that, People who are not crypto native, they don't understand why Ethereum is so expensive. They don't understand why you're paying $10 for a transaction or $10 for an approval or confirmation. They want to live in an environment where they, where they can join it, but it doesn't hurt their bottom line. And you know, what we advocate for, obviously, and this is the Ethereum role centric movement, is to have these things occur in environments you know, that are significantly cheaper. And finally, it leads to more on-chain interactions. You know, DAOs, don't, they, they use snapshot, they don't use on-chain voting because it's, it's, it's often extremely inefficient. Um, they might not take certain activities because they don't want to have to do an on-chain activity. So this is the kind of, you know, kind of thing I think that we can all progress forward as a community together. And here's, here, here's another one, and this is a little bit more technical, and I'm not the most technical on the team to talk about, but we get this question a lot, is how do we think about finality? And you know, the response that we have is there's different forms of finality. In, it, in, when you're interacting with rollups. So we have the sequencer, which gives you, if you've ever used Arbitrum, that like really nice one-click instant sub-second finality of confirmation of your transaction. But then what is the life cycle of that transaction? So that transaction will get aggregated and batched and post to Ethereum. And that happens on average about every three minutes or so, depending on the, tr the, the transaction volume on chain. And at that point, you have your data on Ethereum. But during an optimistic rollup, a fraud proof window opens. So for some transactions, that, for some use cases, that sub-second finality is perfect. For some use cases, you know, you want to wait three minutes. And then other use cases, you have the certification where the challenge period has closed. So you know, really pushing forward the, the conversation of what does finality mean? What kind of finality do you need for your application to get comfortable from a security perspective? Um, I think is a critical conversation that, that we, we see happen in the developer community, but is maybe not as, as understood in, in, the, in the broader ecosystem. And I think this is an important one, cross-chain messaging. So we all see what's going on, right? There's, there's Arbitrum, there's Optimism, Starknet, now Polygon, ZK, EVM, all these different roll-up solutions. Then you have side chains and alternative layer ones, and people are everywhere. We're living in a multi-chain future. And right now, there's a ton of liquidity fragmentation around that. There's a ton of you know, UX issues with wallets, people having to change wallet, change, you know, change um, RPCs, change who they interact with. And there's a ton that can be done to improve this, right? If, if you're not crypto native and you go to MetaMask and you want to use an application on Arbitrum and then you have to change it to Ethereum and then you have to change it to a different environment, um, we really have to improve this UX. You know, and we're looking to improve our UX at the bridge level, but I think at the general level with wallets, applications that are multi-chain, we really have to be thinking about how do we not just improve the user experience from switching between networks, how do we make that seamless under the hood, but also liquidity fragmentation. I know like the, the layer zero team is doing a lot of work around this, but I, you know, one thing that we're focused on is how do, how do we continue in, with liquidity fragmentation concerns? So what's the Arbitrum roadmap? Were two things we're super excited about. One is Arbitrum Nitro, which is the V2 of the technology. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of you know, the technical differences. So the things that matter the most are throughput and cost. So when we launch Arbitrum, it's going to be at least five times more capacity on chain when we, when we launch the Nitro um, on mainnet. And costs are going to come down probably about 30%. 
Um, and we're really excited about that. We've introduced new compression algorithms, um, have found other ways to continue to optimize. Um, and it's going to be much more native to Ethereum. We're going to be using the Geth client, so people will be much more familiar on the node side. And we're really excited about that. Um, the other thing we're working on is any trust chains. And what we've seen, you know, sort of living the Arbitrum life for the last year is that right now, for certain use cases, using a roll-up technology and posting all call data to Ethereum is still a little bit too expensive. So there's some cost-sensitive, you know, use cases, whether it's around social or gaming, that really need, you know, pennies transactions, and they can't take a transaction, like a typical Uniswap transaction today on Arbitrum is around 20 cents. So for DeFi, you know, applications that, have, that, that really need that security, you know, we, we've gotten feedback that that's, that's appropriate, but there's, you know, many applications and use cases that's still too prohibitively expensive. And the reason for that is, you know, there's different business models. So some, some gaming studios are looking to abstract gas from their users. And if, there's char if it's 20 cents for a transaction, they can't afford to do that. So we launched something called Arbitrum AnyTrust. And the way it works at a very high level, um, it, it has a, a data, availability committee, data availability committee, which is storing the data. Um, and it only posts data on Ethereum if there's ever like a disagreement. And then it falls back into an, into an optimistic roll-up. So in an optimistic case, you don't have to post data to Ethereum. You only post it if there's ever some sort of disagreement with the committee and the validators. Um, and the advantage of this is that you don't have to post call data for every transaction onto Ethereum layer one. So this will bring down, this will bring down transaction costs significantly. We rolled this out um, on mainnet for developers last week, and it's going to be going live to users very shortly. So thank you very much for listening. If you ever want to learn more about Arbitrum, you can reach me um, on Twitter or reach out to the team. Um, and um, thank you. And we have a few minutes. And uh, a few minutes if you have anyone has any questions about the Arbitrum ecosystem or anything else. OK. Thank you.